What a privilege it has been to be here this weekend, um, to spend time with your students. Um, you know, this is actually the, uh, the third Sunday I've been able to worship at the, the crossing, and every time it's just been a blessing for both me and my wife. And unfortunately, she wasn't able to be here this weekend, but she sends her prayers. She texted me this morning and saying she is praying for us. And uh, she is worshiping our Lord back at our church in Abilene and um, is in a way just uh, uh, here with us in uh, spirit as she sends her prayers. But we have thoroughly enjoyed every opportunity we've been able to have to uh, be in this, uh, in this church and with uh, you all. Um, as I mentioned, this is my third time. I've uh, been able to be here a couple of times because of my friendship with Kingsley and Olivia and uh, Chris as well. And, uh, in fact, I can remember the first time that I uh, sort of had my uh, ex uh, experience, my first experience with the Crossing Baptist Church. It was a couple of summers ago. Um, I was working uh, at Logston Seminary, and I was at uh, the uh, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship General Assembly in Dallas um, working as an exhibitor. And uh, the Crossing was doing a, a showcase of what it looks like to have a multicultural worship service. And I went there to support Chris, uh, uh, my friend, but also because I was really interested as somebody who um, enjoys uh, multiculturalism and sees that as really a, a passion. So I went and um, I couldn't help but feel like I was getting a glimpse of what John talks about in Revelation 7, where he has this heavenly uh, vision of what the fully inaugurated kingdom of God will look like. And he says there will be representatives from all 12 tribes. And what does he say? He says, and there will be a multitude of people. A multitude that nobody could number. And that there will be people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every language. But in unison, they will be clothed in white robes, with palm branches clutched in their hands, and all saying the same praise. They'll say, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. But we also know that it, when we look at Revelation 7, that while uh, the kingdom of God will be one of diversity, where there will be people from every tribe and tongue, it will also be a kingdom of God where justice is finally done. If you keep reading in Revelation chapter 7, it says, there will be no more hunger There'll be no more thirst, no more mourning, no more crying. There'll be no more sickness. Because the kingdom of God has finally arrived. The kingdom of God will finally be present. It'll finally be inaugurated and complete. And it'll be a beautiful thing. This weekend, um, we read earlier some of our our verses for the weekend, our theme verse, Micah 6, 8. The setting for Micah 6, uh, 8 is uh, you have Israel who had broken the covenant that they made with God. They had forgotten that God brought them out of Egypt, that God delivered Moses to lead them, that God liberated them from their enslavement by the Egyptians. They had forgotten that and they had, for, they had failed to do justice. They had failed to love mercy and failed to walk humbly. And Micah speaks into this, this situation where the people of God are trampling on the poor. They're exploiting the oppressed. You know, I, I told students this weekend that when I was their age, when somebody used the word justice, I often thought of superhero movies or cop TV shows. I think of like the Hawaii Five-O theme song. Or, or things like that, or the Superman theme song. Those are the things that I thought of. You see, my mind was simply unaware of the some 30 million individuals who are forced into illegal slavery. My eyes were blinded to the cyclical and generational poverty because I wasn't in those neighborhoods. My ears were deaf to the sound of those of the faith who are being persecuted in the Middle East, in Asia, Latin America, and around the globe. My feet were bound because my world box that I lived in was tight. 
and confined. My hands were still because I wasn't aware of the one in six families in Texas that cannot put food on their table every day. Because of this, my mouth was silent. To put it bluntly, bluntly, I was ignorant. So what changed? You see, when it comes to biblical justice, when it comes to this command from Micah 6, 8, to act justly or do justice, as some translations say, to love mercy and to walk humbly, what changed? I find that often it's actually not the statistics that I shared that change people, that inspire people to move. But it's actually stories. That stories are perhaps the most effective way in talking about what it means to do justice or in communicating what injustice looks like in our world. Stories like this from a pastor in Austin. He had a family come twice to the church for financial assistance. When they came to him for a second time for financial assistance, the pastor and deacons decided to look into their situation, wondering why they continued to need help. What they found was a hole in the family's budget, created by a payday loan. The father had taken out a $700 loan, and $200 was being withdrawn from his checking account every two weeks. This had gone on for four and a half months. After paying $1,800 towards the $700 loan, they still had not reduced anything that they had owed. When the church stepped in to help them out, they had to pay nearly $1,500 to pay off the loan. That's $3,300 for a $700 loan. When I think of injustice, I think of stories. Stories like these words from Reverend Dr. Supo Ayokunle from the nation of Nigeria, where he is president of the Nigerian Baptist Convention. He said to us, those of us who were at the Baptist World Alliance this uh, meeting this past summer in Vancouver, he said, does it not matter to the rest of the world that, Bo it, does it not matter to the rest of the world if Boko Haram continues to kill hundreds of my people every week? Are these people less human than those being killed in other places where they have gone to directly intervene? My people are being killed like animals in the world. is just watching. I had known about Nigeria and the situation there prior to hearing Reverend Dr. Oyokunle. But meeting him in person and other Nigerian ministers this past summer opened my eyes in new ways, moved my feet to participation and ultimately awakened me to reality. But it's not only stories of trial and tribulation, it's also stories of hope, imagination, courage, humility, and perseverance. I think of William Wilberforce, who led the fight for emancipation of slaves in England. Or I think of John Leland, who believed so strongly in religious liberty for all, that he was able to sway James Madison, who will become known as the father of the Constitution, to include an amendment on religious freedom. I think of Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador, who could no longer sit by and watch the persecution of his people by the religious and political elite. He would eventually pay his life for what he stood for and was murdered while giving mass. I think of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who was bold enough to dream big dreams, inspiring all of us who have come after him to keep dreaming those dreams. A day that we know through Revelation 7 will be fully inaugurated with the kingdom of God. I think of our Savior Jesus Christ, who humbled himself and took on flesh the ultimate form of solidarity with humankind and went to the cross but began his ministry it says in Luke chapter 4 in his hometown of Nazareth and said the spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor to bring liberty to the captives and the oppressed to bring sight back to the blind and to proclaim this is the year of the Lord's favor I think of Christ when I think of stories of what it means 
to do justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly. You see, stories have a way of moving us. We all have favorite stories, but whether it's a book or a film or a TV series, stories inspire us. They, they can play with our emotions. They can excite us. They can make us cry. Perhaps you can think of that movie you can't watch without tearing up. What power stories hold. Power to engage in our emotions. And perhaps this is why when discovering the injustice in our world and discovering what it means to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly, stories are most effective. And so today, I want to talk about a story. You see, Jesus told many stories. We just call them parables. And so, for the next 15 minutes or so, I'd like for us to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Now, if I had to guess, many of you are probably fairly familiar with this parable. In fact, I would be willing to go out on a limb that you've probably heard a sermon or two over it. And so today what I want us to do is I want us to, to think about it as we think about stories. You see, good stories are the ones that kind of make us think, you know. Or, or maybe like, you know, you have that TV show that you know, keeps you coming back every week because there's, you're always thinking about it and asking questions. So there are some questions that I want us to ask as we come to this text so we can dig a little bit deeper into what's, what Jesus is communicating. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 27. And behold, a teacher of the law stood up to put Jesus to test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the teacher answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replied, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the teacher of the law, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, But who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? teacher of the law said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. As I mentioned, you probably are familiar with this story. It begins with this setting where this, this teacher of the law comes to Christ and we might think he, he might be a little snarky here. Because he says, and, and who is my neighbor? Almost like he's trying to trap Jesus. Jesus and it's very, very normal for him, decides to share a parable. And as I said, you likely know it well. This man is going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He is robbed, beaten, and left to die. But a Samaritan, oh, or excuse me, but a priest, thank goodness, a priest walks by. For this would be the humanitarian, this would be the pastor, the minister. This would be who you would expect to stop and help this victim. But the priest walks by. 
Then a Levite comes by. Oh, thank goodness a Levite comes by. A Levite would be considered to be someone a part of the fold of God and would be somebody likely with both religious and political clout in society. Again, though, somebody you would expect to be the good guy, the humanitarian, to stop by and save this person. A question that we have to ask is, why do they pass by? Perhaps it is because they were desensitized to this image. You see, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was known for being treacherous. A 17-mile road that was known for being dangerous and deadly. It would not be uncommon for somebody to be robbed on that road. Maybe they were desensitized to that injustice. Or perhaps they were a little too concerned about their own social status. You see, in that society, should they touch a dying body or a dead corpse, they would be labeled as unclean, lowering their status in a society built on honor and shame. But a Samaritan walks by. Jesus uses a Samaritan in the story of teaching what it means to love your neighbor. Why does Jesus use a Samaritan in this story? If we look back to Luke chapter 9, just one chapter before, there's a really interesting story regarding the Samaritan people. Verses 51 through 56 it says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people, the Samaritans, did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And so they went on to another village. You see, Jews and Samaritans, they're not exactly friends. The Samaritans had a different place of worship and even had some different scriptures. And so the first instinct of James and John is to consider them an abomination and treat them like sodomites by calling down fire from heaven. But Jesus rebuked them because Jesus knew that the kingdom of God is big enough for second chances, sinners, and saints, and big enough for the Samaritan people. And Jesus uses this individual to show what it means to love your neighbor. You see, this Samaritan wasn't worried about being deemed unclean. Perhaps he was seen as unclean already by some people in his society. Samaritans were not desensitized to this because they knew what it was like to be cast on the side of the road, maybe literally, but also figuratively. They knew perhaps what oppression looked like firsthand. Perhaps the Samaritan had felt it before. But you know what? This aspect of the story is pretty common knowledge, I find, in most churches. They're pretty aware of this. What I find so interesting about the parable of the Good Samaritan is the identity of the victim on the side of the road. You see, Jesus so carefully paints this picture involving a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. He's so carefully to communicate this message to this teacher of the law, chooses these three identities in his story. And yet, he decides to leave open-ended the identity of the victim on the side of the road. It is so interesting to me that Jesus would do that. And when Luke is recording the story, that Luke would continue that. So might we ask, why? Why does Jesus feel that there isn't a need to explain who the person on the side of the road is? You see, I think that Jesus just as intentionally left that part out as he did when he was choosing the identities of these other individuals in his story, in his parable. In other words, Jesus intentionally doesn't tell us who the victim is because it doesn't matter. Now, when I say it doesn't matter, I don't mean they don't matter. I mean that it didn't matter if that person was a Jew 
or a Samaritan or Gentile. That wasn't what was important. He did this to intentionally communicate that we are to be a neighbor to all. This is an intentional choice by Christ. Regardless of how different we might think the person on the side of the road is, it simply does not matter because we are called to be a neighbor to all, no matter what. You see, the priest and the Levite were worried, perhaps even fearful, about losing status. Or maybe they were uncomfortable in what they thought was an awkward situation, perhaps. They sought personal gain and protection but instead received spiritual uncleanliness. They wanted to remain clean, but their hands are dirty with the blood of the victims, these 30 plus million individuals who are enslaved around the world illegally. The persecuted church in Nigeria, Iraq, and so many other places. The individuals struggling to get out of this cyclical poverty, dealing with a predatory payday loan. This is who they passed by. This is who they did not want to touch. This is who they did not want to help. But the Samaritan, he wasn't afraid to aid this person because he walked humbly. He was not concerned with his status in society. He was not worried about being labeled unclean. Instead, he was concerned about doing justice and loving mercy. This is continuously evident by the rest of the story, the last section that we read. Because the Samaritan goes to great lengths to show love and kindness. It says that he had compassion on the victim. This weekend, we talked to our students about how compassion, at its root in its Latin form, means to suffer with somebody, to suffer alongside them. The Samaritan was willing to suffer, was willing to pay whatever costs to show mercy. The Samaritan walked humbly, loved mercy, and did justice. You see, sometimes when we think of a calling like Micah 6.8, we think it's daunting. We might have these statistics running in our head of just all the bad things that go on in our world. And there is some truth to that. It is daunting a little bit. But this story paints a picture that doing justice in its simplest form means willing to get our hands dirty. Being willing to be aware of our surroundings, being willing to be aware of the victim on the side of the road and not pass by as if he or she is not there as if he or she does not matter to God. Regardless of our presuppositions, whether they matter to God or not. Doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly means being willing to be a good neighbor and caring for those who cannot care for themselves. It means that we be like the Samaritan whose eyes were not tunnel vision whose heart was not desensitized to the pain, suffering, oppression, and injustice of our world, whose ears were willing to hear those cries for help on the side of the road, whose feet were willing to cross onto that side of the road and go the extra mile, the Samaritan whose hands were willing to be unclean, ministering in the reality of this world. The reality is that we live in a place where injustice does take place. But we know. We know as the body of Christ, as the church, we are working towards the inauguration of the kingdom of God that we read earlier. And what does the kingdom of God look like? As John says, there will be a great multitude of people from every background, every tribe, every language, and they'll be worshiping in unison, and there will be no more hunger. There will be no more thirst. There will be no more crying. There will be joy because the kingdom of God is finally here and justice has finally been done. 
This is a story of inspiration to go and be like the Samaritan, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. We'll have a time of response now. Perhaps maybe if you're a student, you've been thinking through some things this weekend, and this can be a time where you can speak with God or speak to somebody up here that would love to pray for you. Or perhaps a commitment to follow the calling that Micah sets out before us to, to act justly, walk humbly, and love mercy. There will be some people down here to pray with you if you need to make any kind of decision or if you just simply need a listening ear and a steady praying voice.